They've been around since the beginning. But what do we really know about them? It's time to start asking questions. I'm Chris Brunt. This is Padre. I'm a millennial parent, so I basically document every single day of their lives in photos, in videos. I like to share a lot of that too. I mean, I like to show friends and family how funny they are and how cute they are and what cool kids they are. The thing though is that, of course, that content that I'm sharing is curated, right? Like I'm showing you the good stuff. Case in point, Last November, we drove out to Letchworth State Park. This place where the Genesee River flows through this gorge and drops about 600 feet. It's an incredibly beautiful place. It's not too far from where we live. We'd never been there before. We parked the car and I'm excited. And I'm thinking, this is gonna be pretty great. And we get to the edge and it took my breath away. How tall do you think that waterfall is, Julian? 700 feet. 700 feet? It was stunning. I'd never seen a waterfall that big. And I said, Julian, come here, you gotta see this. I couldn't wait for him to see it. And he runs over and he's just like me, has the same reaction, just astonished. And I'm, I'm looking over, I'm kind of doing the parent thing. I'm seeing like, where are the danger spots? Where can somebody slip and fall? And I'm thinking, this, this is pretty open. Like they don't have a railing up or anything. But he climbs up right at the edge. And I'm saying, whoa, 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 hold on there. Just sit, sit right where you are. He sits long enough for me to take one photo. He looks at me. I snap the photo. The waterfall is raging behind him. There's this mist catching sunlight. It's a beautiful photo. And then it's over. I put the phone in my pocket and he's climbing farther and farther out and I'm telling him not to and I'm getting scared. I'm saying, Hey man, Hey, whoa, 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 whoa. Stop, 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 stop. And he's arguing with me. He's saying, no, 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 I can do it. I'm fine. I got it. And now I'm getting really scared because it's, it, you know, it's, it's tapping into that kind of primal place as a parent. So of course I'm just reacting and I grab him, and we're doing this kind of dance where I You know, I don't want to startle him. I don't want him to fight against me because then he might really lose his footing. Finally, I just, I'm like, I can't do this. And I pick him up and I take him away from the waterfall. And he is furious and he's yelling at me that he, he's not going to fall. He knows what he's doing and to let him go and let him go back there. But now I'm dug in and I'm saying, no way, I'm not letting you go back there. If you're not going to listen, we're not going to do it. And I find myself walking back to the car as I'm holding him and I'm carting him away. And he's trying to get away from me. He's kind of kicking and thrashing and wiggling his hips. He's trying to break my hold on him. And I get him in the car and I put him in his seat and I uh, I don't even try to buckle him up. There's no way that's going to work. Now he's irate. We're both angry where our adrenaline is up. And I get into the front seat and I sit there and I say, we're done. This is it. I'm not going back out there. And I mean, it was just miserable. We're both miserable. And it took a while for our anger to subside. Finally, it just kind of wears itself out. And I say, you want to go find mommy and Nico? They're probably hiking down the trail. Let's go. Let's go find them. And we get out and we we spend the rest of the day playing around in the park, but we never really recover from that. Like neither of us were in a great mood for the rest of the day. And I posted that photo of him smiling in front of the waterfall. And every time I would see it, I think, God, (laughs) this post has nothing to do with what that day was really like. The hurt feelings, the second guessing, Just the wishing it had all gone down differently. Was I too hard? Yeah, probably. Did I overreact? Yeah. Did I just get stubborn and and refuse to budge? Yeah. 
Is that what my dad would have done? 100%. Is that your best radio voice? No, it is not. Oh, that's nice. No, it is not my best radio voice. That's a lot better. This is my best radio voice. Oh, I like that. That's, that's nice and resonant. Yeah. Yeah. That's really resonant. You have a very low and resonant voice. Don't you have an even better voice? You have a lovely baritone. Yeah, you do, too. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> no, okay. thank you. Okay, 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 okay. That's it, that's it, that's it, that's it. That's it. Thank you. Today on Padre, I'm talking to writer, critic, and father of two, Keith Gessen. Keith has a new nonfiction book called Raising Raffi, which I recommend to all the dads out there. It's a book that raises questions that I'm interested in working through on this show over the long haul. Questions such as, what do you do when your ideals about fatherhood and parenting meet with the sometimes sobering reality of what your kids are really like? What you're like? as a parent, who you really are as a human being. Why am I like this? Can I change? How do I change? You know, by the time my firstborn was three, what had seemed so easy and natural and joyful became much harder, much more fraught, laden with all kinds of psychodynamics that I frankly did not see coming. Like that day at the waterfall, I kept failing to meet these moments. And as my kid became more and more challenging to parent, I saw myself getting farther and farther away from who I wanted to be as his dad. And so I had to start reevaluating everything. And it was difficult and confusing. And sometimes it was a little alienating, but it was necessary. Here's me at home on the couch a few months ago giving a status update. I think what you're hearing here is the aftermath of some minor disciplinary incident with my eldest son. Thankfully, nowhere near the kinds of volcanic ordeals we used to find ourselves in on an all-too-regular basis. He and I have both been making progress on keeping those at bay, but an incident nonetheless. Anyway, it's me at home doing some quiet podcasting, and you'll hear in the background what Julian is doing to work through his feelings. He plays his ukulele, even when he's angry or in trouble, he runs upstairs, grabs his ukulele, and we hear it all throughout the house. It's pretty good. We go skateboarding just about every day. He's in love with it. And it's terrifying, but it's amazing to watch him get better so quickly. And most importantly, he's become a really great, great big brother. Super sweet. But if I had been making this podcast a year ago, the vibe would have been very different. We were pretty close to despair. Every single day, it just felt like an endless sort of battle. And everything became adversarial. And there were just tantrums and blow-ups and uh, quarrels galore. And then the little guy made his presence known. End of recording. I don't do a lot of podcasting when they're in the building because it's physically, or at least aesthetically, impossible. But I wanted you to hear that clip because I know there are parents out there listening right now who may be going through a hard time with their kids. And I certainly know what that's all about. But you know, you can you can hear it in my voice on that tape. We can come through those hard times if we do our part. And when we do, even if the good weather doesn't last forever, we can luxuriate in those moments. We can lay back and enjoy the music. So Keith and I are going to talk about that journey we have to go on, the long road we dads must travel, of self-knowledge and self-understanding, of discipline and acceptance, and what we're really trying to do here. We're going to talk about anger, 
what it's like to be a bear dad. Bear dad. That's Keith's name for it, but I like it. I think I'm going to keep using it. Keith Gessen, great guy, terrific writer, and I think the two of us had a great conversation. Stay tuned. That's next. That has happened to a certain extent. You know, I've gotten to talk about parenting on my doing events, but also kind of, you know, there's a lot of podcasts. No, uh, no offense. Yours is the best. Yeah. No, obviously that goes without saying. (laughs) You know, that's that actually just being able to do these kind of conversations has been very satisfying. But, you know, in this particular instance, there's always been a bit of a kind of irony about um, dad, me writing a book about raising Rafi, right? Which has not always been the most popular activity uh, here at home. <laughs> and, the writing of the and, book, you mean? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. And, uh, you know, like when I had to like, you know, there was like, I didn't do this a lot, but like there was one, you know, like when I was kind of finishing a draft and I really like, you know, when you're, I, I've found that you can kind of muddle along writing things like piece by piece, right? And then at a certain point, you really need to clear a certain amount of time and just, just be able to read the thing all the way through, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Like in two days or whatever, right? Yeah. However long it takes. And you need kind of uninterrupted time, right? Um, without the kids. So, so there was like a three-day weekend where I went upstate to a friend's cabin, mm-hmm. you know, for three days. But even that, it was like, I'm, I'm writing Raising Rafi, but actually Emily is Raising Rafi. <laughs> so um in this particular case with this particular book uh i'm okay with not doing like a multi-city tour and abandoning my family that's funny to talk about you know what a wonderful father i am parent writers man like with just things that you don't think about until you're you're no. knee deep in it and you're like how the fuck are we gonna do this um mm-hmm. but it all works out mm-hmm. somehow it all works out somehow <laughs> well keith we uh I, I thought I would just try to kind of recite our many points of connection that you and I should. This is the first time I'm actually meeting you, um, mm-hmm. which is kind of surprising to me because I've been hearing about you for like 20 years. But we're both graduates of the Syracuse MFA program, which means that we both, you know, worked with George Saunders. And we both, I think to this day, still have to explain ourselves to Mary Carr. We are, we're both the beneficiaries of, of, of Mary's mentorship and friendship and, you know, honesty. Um, <laughs> yes. And you co-founded N Plus One. I mm. built my whole personality, at least in my 20s, around N Plus One um, as, yeah. <laughs> as, a, as, a, as a reader. Um, I wanted to tell you, man, when, uh, I, when I first got to graduate school, I'd already been reading N Plus One forever, like from the beginning, and I loved it. And I just moved, got into my apartment in Syracuse, and my subscription lapsed. Cause I was just so broke. I was just like a first year, you know, living on that stipend. And I was talking to Mary Carr's sister, Lisa, and I'm on the phone with Lisa and I'm telling her like my N plus one subscription lapsed. Hint, hint. I'm so fucking broke. So Lisa sends you guys an email and she copies me on it. And I think she sent it to you and to Mark. Um, and she says, uh, right. Hey guys, yeah. you're doing great work. Here's a check for $500. Uh, this ought to be enough to get this broke ass poet a lifetime subscription, you know, love you, Lisa, <laughs> you know, and it was just this right. baller ass yeah. move. Yeah. And I was like, hell yeah, Lisa, I got a lifetime subscription <laughs> in plus one. So it was great. You guys hooked Amazing. me up for like a yeah. year and then you asked for more money. Um, <laughs> so it just, it all got you as a, was a number of subscription. <laughs> That's very expensive when your subscription. That's okay. Yeah. Good, good. Good friend plus one. Nice. So, you yeah, hustle. and then you got to hustle to keep the keep the lights on. Yeah. There. yeah. Um, you know, and I wish I wish I could, you know, talk to you about the the magazine and how that all started, but that'll have to be for another interview because I've just read this this amazing book of yours, this brand new book Raising Rafi and it's it's a beautiful book for so many reasons that I'm going to ask you to talk about, but but once again, it's just the the way that I relate to it on a personal level is, is, is uncanny. I mean, your boys are, are roughly the same age as mine and roughly the same years apart. And the, the, the titular character, your eldest son, Rafi, reminds me so much of my oldest son, Julian, 
at every mm-hmm. step that you describe at every kind of stage of development, it was like reading like my own dad diary or something. Uh-huh. I mean, the only, the only reading experience I can compare it to, and sorry if this is weird to you, but it was a little bit like when I, when I started recovery and the very first time I read the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous and I was like, uh-huh. Holy shit. Someone else has had these thoughts. Someone else has gone through what I thought were these like unique and very private experiences with these very, you know, personal ways of looking at this, at this deeply complex thing. And here it is laid out in black and white and it's exactly how I felt about it. Wow. Um, So what's, um, I don't know what the big book is. It's like, it's the book that they give you when you join AA. It's the big book Mm -hmm. that's got all the stories and all the ideas about the program. And it just sort of tells you like, this is what an addict is. This is what an alcoholic is. And for me, the first time I read that, I didn't know other people felt that way. Like I didn't Mm -hmm. know that that my experience could be so perfectly and lucidly captured by this, by this book that was just sitting out there the whole time. So big book, is it, is it, it's like they've collected stories over the years from people about their addiction? It's the book that started AA because the guys who wrote mm-hmm. it were the kind of founders of the program. So they kind of mm-hmm. tell their story and mm-hmm. then they say like, here's how we recover, right? Here, like, mm-hmm. Here's the program. Mm-hmm. Basically, here are the steps and here's everything we went through. But the, the part of it that was striking is like the first 20 or 30 pages, mm-hmm. you get their story, but you also get their mindset. They're like, this is what it feels like to be an alcoholic. And mm-hmm. the first time I read that, I had never heard anyone speak about that. Mm-hmm. And I thought that all of those thoughts and feelings and problems and tensions and conflicts were like just completely, you know, sui generis. They're like, I just made them all up in my own head. And here it was in this book. Um, yeah. And reading your, your, your kind of chronicle of parenting, a kid that in so many ways resembles my own, was a similar kind of uncanny experience. I'm just like, okay, all right, I'm not the only one out there. <laughs> yeah, you know who has a kid amazing. like this that's... and who's who and, and who has these particular kinds of joys and challenges julian's uh he's a handful yeah you know i mean yeah. you 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 uh, i wrote down so many ways that you describe him but you've got him he is adorable infuriating mercurial he still treats us like servants he is <laughs> unlike anyone we have ever met i read that to chanel this morning i was like you got to hear this and she's like that's it that's it that's it. That's our boy. <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, the, the key part that I kept coming back to was the sort of the, you call it civil dis, uh, excuse me, uncivil disobedience that comes in <laughs> cycles, right? This behavioral yes. pattern, yeah. you know? And so reading it was just, um, it was wonderful to coexist in a space with someone who's been through that and who gets it and can explain it so lucidly. And you're also like, I mean, I'll take help from wherever I can get it to just get a little bit better at this, to get a little more Mm -hmm. patient at this, to get a little Mm -hmm. more tolerant, a little more understanding. Um, Yeah. So thank you, man. I, I, you you write in the book that you, you, you're talking about someone else's book, but you say, uh, I read this book slowly and with immense gratitude. And that is how I felt as a reader of your book. Thank you. Yeah. That's, and the book I was talking about there was, was that, that uh, Ames and Ilg book which is really just kind of a series of observations about they had a, they had like a lab for observing little children and, and they just, it's just a series of observations about what little children do. Um, and it's from, it's mostly from like the fifties and sixties, but it was, it was uncanny how much of the stuff that those little kids did, you know, was, was stuff that Rafi did. Mm-hmm. And I read it at a, at a moment when Rafi was, you know, it, it was one of the most difficult moments where, where he had turned three and then we'd had his little brother. So like we had all the stress of a newborn and then Rafi, like kind of on his worst behavior, you know, partly because he had been sort of removed from the center of the universe, but, I, but, but mostly because he was three, yeah. you know, and like three is just a tough age. Mm. And, and I was reading these books as I, as I kind of describe in that essay, you know, and I was, you know, I was losing my temper with him a lot. and. Uh, reading books that gave like, you know, that told you what to do. Basically, there were these like kind of instruction manuals, right? And I read the instruction manual, which is from the kind of behaviorist perspective, which was mm-hmm. like just ignore everything that he does, ignore it, and, you know, and give and give him a sticker when he does something nice. Yep, yeah, ignore every, all the bad stuff. Give him a sticker when he does something good. Um, and that didn't work for us. And then 
I read the other, the opposite of that, which is like really talk it out with him and, you know, listen to his feelings. And that didn't work either. Mm -hmm. Or I was really bad at it, you mm -hmm. know, and, and kind of none of the stuff was working. And then I finally read this book that was just like, it wasn't like, here's what you should do. It was more like, here's what three-year-olds are like. Descriptive um, rather than prescriptive, exactly, right? Like exactly, yeah, and and um, yeah, I found that incredibly helpful. Just just being like, okay, you know, Rafi's his own person, but this is kind of what three year olds are like. Yeah, all that really matters um, is the energy between you and your kid, because at three, <laughs> they're going to be three, right? Three year olds are going to yeah. three year old. I mean, we did the exact same stuff, except I have less patience or, or less kind of discipline than you. I'm not a, I'm not a professional literary critic. So I try to read those books and be like, get through 10 pages and be like, this shit ain't going to work. Like we read this, the <laughs> Danish way of parenting, the Swedish way, uh -huh. bringing a baby uh -huh. is the, you know, is, is, is science fiction. Yeah. Um, exactly. all the, <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's a really fun book, but come on, like, what are you talking about? You know, I, but we read all of them. We got, we got a whole shelf of those books. And yes. and Chanel would read them and say, like, here's your assignment tonight. You need to read these three chapters. <laughs> so, uh -huh. so you quit yelling like a lunatic at our kid. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I'm reading it. And then, like, I hear us trying out those those techniques the next day. And we sound absurd, right, to each other and to Julian, who would be yes. like, you know, like we'd do that thing where you repeat back, like, I hear that you're very angry about this. Right. And he'd be like, why right. the fuck are you saying? Like, stop it. You know, he would just immediately <laughs> reject that tactic. Yes. He would call yes. it out. He'd be like, would you read that in a book? Fuck that shit. <laughs> you know, he was, he was always a step ahead of us, you know. That's like, right. That's right. Uh, yeah. I mean, I read those, it, it was, I, I read those books less as like a professional literary critic and more as just like a very desperate person, <laughs> you know, who was. Uh, trying to figure out how to deal with the situation. And I, you know, like I have found those books, you know, here and there, like you pick up a tip, right. You know, so what I used to do is be like, you lose TV. Mm -hmm. Right. And mm -hmm. then of course that was dumb because mm. TV is awesome. Yeah. And like you take a little break when they watch TV. So now what I do it's a rookie mistake. is I say, you lose, uh, you lose 10 minutes of TV. And 10 minutes, 10 minutes out of how much what? dad, right? I, exactly. <laughs> Nobody knows. Like, and show it, me the legend. Feels, well, but he doesn't know. He's like, shoot, you know, I lost 10 minutes. Yeah. Right. I didn't, I, I gotta, I don't want to lose another 10 minutes. Right. I'm going to, I better do this thing. It's the it's principle weird, of, but, of having but lost. I like, yeah. And I, yeah. So losing 10 minutes, <laughs> that I feel thing. like that was a pretty good innovation <laughs> in my, in my parenting. That's good. Life. I might, I might steal that. I like Thank that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Let's lose it's, 10 uh, minutes. It's, it's lose 10 minutes of skateboarding. Yes. I think that'll be from now on, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I mean, that's the thing yeah. is that like, you, they're so fucking clever and, and Julian is so naturally manipulative that he will always ask the kind of question that it dismantles the whole technique. Mm. Um, but there's still a way to kind of be create, creative and almost silly enough to kind of outflank, but it requires a certain disposition of like, all right, this isn't combat. This is, you know, a sort of contest of creativity here, right? Like who's going to, who's going to be creative enough to kind of get the upper hand. It doesn't have right. to be that turn into this brute force showdown of yes. like, because yes. I'm your father. Right. No, that's, that's very wise. And, and also like, yes, they're very smart, but they still don't know what time is. Yeah. You know, they have no, they don't know what half an hour is, mm -hmm. right? Even Rafi now at seven, he doesn't really know what half an hour is. So, you know, there are, we do still have some advantages that we can leverage. I mean, you can uh, you know. think of it that way or that they have the advantage <laughs> because they can just ask every minute, has it been 30 minutes yet? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> right. So who really has the upper hand there? Yeah, it's my yeah, question. No, it's, yeah, I don't know, they're, man. They're it's pretty powerful. You, you, you write about it. So, um, so clearly and, and frankly, um, the sort of pathos of parenting a wildly sensitive and unruly little boy. At one point you call him a little maniac, which I love. I love that phrase. Um, cause there's warmth in it too. You, and, and, and you say that you, you want more than anything to be this warm presence in his life mm. and yet not being able to stop the sort of constant conflict around mm -hmm. his behavior, which mm -hmm. only gets worse when baby bro arrives and, yeah. and sort of scrambles yeah. the whole family calculus. Yeah. Um, I remember that so well, and it was right around three, right? Where all of a sudden he went from this sort of angelic, all sweet, all the time 
little heavenly little creature who was just so miraculous. And all we did was laugh and adore. And then it was like one day, man, I like looked back and said, when did I start yelling at this guy so much? Like, when yeah. did he start being able to just make me lose my temper? And it was somewhere around three. It was when we, yeah. we, we had a move yeah. from Houston to Memphis. And suddenly I realized I yell at him so much now. And it broke my heart. Like, I felt so bad about it. Yeah. And it's taken me years of just work and, and, and suffering <laughs> to sort of see my way through. Like, what kind of dad am I going to be? And, and there's been so much fear in that of like, God, what if it's always going to be this way? Or what if he's always going to see me as this kind of stern ogre figure when all I really want to be is this like warm, fun, accepting, loving person to him, <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. And, and um, do you still, are you, do you still yell? Oh yeah. I yelled today. Yeah. Yeah. Today, yeah me too. Yeah. This morning. Yeah. Um, but that, you know, that's one of the things about not being prepared, right? It's like, you're like, oh, I'm idiot dad. Like, I don't know how, I don't know what a uterus is. <laughs> you're like, you know, in the, the, the birth process, you're like, okay, mm -hmm. you know, you learn, you can, you can kind of learn that stuff, but you're, you're, you, you know, you feel like, or I felt like I was really playing catch up um, in terms of my knowledge. And then, um, you know, all the stuff like, how do you, what does a baby wear? Or like, what are they, what are you supposed to do with the baby? You know, he just mm -hmm. seems to sleep all the time. Um, but then there's this kind of other lack of preparation, like of just like psychological preparation for, you know, I had always, whenever the very small amounts of time that I'd spent thinking about uh, fatherhood, I, I kind of pictured myself as this, yes, warm, ironical, mm -hmm. um, you know, father figure, right. And kind of cool. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, instead I find myself, yeah, I, I turned out to be a yeller and, stressed out about stuff mm -hmm. um always kind of chivying everyone mm -hmm. um and you know in the household and like yeah not what i imagined at all you know and then like you know as a kind of part of the book is this journey toward mm, a certain level of like self-acceptance which sounds kind of pat to me but like you know i did I did you know i like in the last essay i talk about like being russian right and and just thinking about how i was raised by a very loving but pretty stern you know father and mm -hmm. who did raise his voice right mm -hmm. and you know and just thinking about like okay that's that's inside of me you know and it comes out in like we used to have like more battles over like screen time there's always the parent who is like less screen time and the parent is like who cares you know right. and i was definitely the less screen time parent Right. Mm -hmm. Because I had, you know, and it was, it was just inside of me. And now it's, now we have these, I wouldn't say they're fights so much, but like this kind of conflict over homework where like, you know, Rafi uh, goes to a, like a very traditional kind of hard driving uh, New York public school and has homework and has had homework, you know, since kindergarten. And it was, you know, and Emily's like, kind of like, eh, he's a little too young for homework. I'm not going to make him do it. Yeah. And I'm like, we got to do the homework. And it's kind of, you know, and like, again, I think if I had thought of my, you know, imagined myself, whatever, 10 years ago, if I had thought for the future, I would be like, I'm not going to be the sort of parent who enforces homework. I know in some intellectual way that like kids should follow their interests. Right. And, and, you know, the way to like make them hate school is to force them to do stuff. Right. But now that I'm in the situation I'm just like, we got to do our homework. <laughs> yeah. We just have to do it. Just like as I always did my homework and, and I always did my homework because we came from the Soviet union and the way that you kind of like entered American society and, and kind of, you know, progressed in it. If you were an immigrant was through school, yeah. you know, and like, I just can't help it. And so, so, you know, toward the end of the book, I'm like, all right, you know, uh, this isn't like the most appealing aspect of me but it's it's in me i can't really get it out of me and i'm just gonna have to work with that <laughs> and that's you know, like that's okay and i i still i'm still trying you know and i'm and i do still yell and i'm trying to yell less <laughs> um progress not and, perfection that's what we say in yeah, the program uh but it, but I, I i don't know if the yelling has changed necessarily but i'm like i'm the yelling one and like raffi knows that 
and Ilya knows that. And yeah, you know, like when I try to switch it up, they, yeah, like you said, they just kind of they don't buy it. I feel like, I mean, I feel like there are two things that you're describing that come in and sort of override the ideal that we sort of set for ourselves pre-parenthood, right? When we're imagining like, what kind of dad am I? She's pregnant. And I'm thinking like, here's the kind of dad I'm going to be, right? Here's my, Mm -hmm. here's my fantasy of fatherhood. And then like two things happen. One is that your kid is your, is their own personality. Yeah. And it's unpredictable and surprising. And you're like, you're now reacting and responding to the kind of kid they are. This did not become fully clear to me until the second, right? Until I have little Nico, who is just totally wired differently and yeah. and requires a different, a little bit different style, right? Yes. If I yell at Julian, he yells back. <laughs> if I yell at Nico, he wilts. And yes. crumples. And yes. I go, oh my God, I'm so sorry. Yes. <laughs> you yes. poor, you poor baby, come Same. here. Same. Right? Yeah. But Julian will step to me. He will stick his chest out, right? Like, and that's the dynamic. So I'm a different dad in some ways to them. But the other thing, so like I'm adjusting to who they are, which I don't have very much control over, it turns out. But the other thing is like, I could not, and I think you were talking about this with your father and, and being, you know, being a Russian immigrant and, and, and just your background, I couldn't in no way appreciate the ways that my sort of template of parenthood has been, you know, inscribed by my own childhood, by my own upbringing, by the sort of authoritarian model of parenting that I grew up under. And then one day I'm in the kitchen and Julian has pushed the, the, the red button in me. Mm-hmm. And what mm-hmm. comes out of my mouth is my dad, you know, yeah. just 100%. And I'm like, yeah. well, <laughs> there goes that ideal, right? Like that stuff's in there, whether I like it or not, I can analyze that. I, you know, I can work on it, but on some level, I also have to accept it or I'm in yeah. denial about it. Right. You know? Um, yeah. And it's like, I had a pretty happy childhood you know so so for me it's like you know uh your dad sound pretty great the way you described him sound like a yeah like you know and like i'm and but you know i'm a very different person and uh but yeah yeah i like my dad so so like i do wonder about with people who who had unhappy childhoods right and like really kind of really don't want to be like their parents right Mm -hmm. um that one's trickier like i don't i mean is that is that what you're describing not quite. I mean, my some, mine's yeah. somewhere in the middle, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But definitely, the style of just the relationship between father and son, I have a you know a very very different, if not opposite, ideal in mind yeah. that I continue yeah. to pursue, but I can't get there because what blocks it is number one that stuff that's hardwired in me the expectations I have for the way a father and a son are going to manage their disagreements and their conflicts, but also Julian's personality and his nature, right? Which is to not only like buck authority and sort of civil disobedience, he rejects the very notion of authority over him, right? Like from the beginning, (laughs) he's like, this is a, Mm -hmm. the three of us, we were like a triumvirate, right? right? Right. But you guys aren't in charge of me. Like, come on, I'm Julian. I am the son. I am the son king. Yes. Um, yes, yes, that's right. Um, yeah, no, and you were saying earlier about, um, you know, how different they are and like, it's, it, that's something that, you know, if I could go back, I would change, you know, about my reactions to Rafi is like when he, I just, I just, when he was little, I just took everything so personally. Yeah. Right. And, you know, when he's like started hitting us when he was, you know, and, and just rejecting us in all these ways. And I was like, ah, oh, like. I did something wrong or like, what, you know, why is this happening? And then I saw the, you know, like when he would say, I hate you or it's in the book, you know, he says, you're not nice. Right. Dad does. You're not a nice dad. I love that. Yeah. And I was just like, oh my God, that's true. I'm not nice. Yeah. And I um, love how you, you, you you own it. You take, you're like, he's right. I'm not a nice dad. (laughs) You know, and it was, you know, yeah, he wasn't wrong. I thought I was, you know, pretty nice, but yeah. And like, I'm sure I could be nice. Well, you try to be nice, um, but you failed at being nice, right? Like that's that's what it is. But, but some of the stuff is just like, you know, there's this moment, 
um, you know, he's like, dad, I, I love you even when you do bad things to me. <laughs> yeah. And it sounds really dark, but actually he just means like turning off, literally just turning off the TV. Yeah. Like, that's what he meant. Yeah. And, uh, so some of those not nice things are like, yeah, I don't think you should watch TV for six hours. Right. right? If that makes me not nice, then yeah, so be it. But, uh, um, but yeah, so I took, but I did take it very personally. And then Ilya comes along this little like angel. So sweet. Um, never gives us any problems. Then he turns three. Right. And starts hitting us. <laughs> right. And, um, and nears, you know, turns four and starts saying all the, I hate you. You're oh not God. a nice dad. Uh, you're a bad dad. Like oh, same exact this, stuff. Man. And I'm like, Oh, <laughs> that's just what, that's just what happened. No, but at the second time around, I was like, Oh, mm. that's just what they say. I you see. Know? I don't know that I'm still ready, but I mean, Nico just turned three last week uh-huh. and he's okay. still the sweetling yeah. and I just can't, I don't know yeah, if I can go through ready, it again, yeah. man. I don't know if I could no, do it. Another- the second time around, you're like, little oh, here Sith it is. apprentice. You it's know? cute. No, I felt like <laughs> when he would hit us, I'd be like, oh, that's so cute. Oh, what a, what a cute. Well, that's the way it is like. when he does every now and then when he goes, oh, man, turn, you turn off Paw Patrol yeah. and he gives you a little whack and it's hilarious. Yeah, yeah. Whereas with Julian, yeah. it was like, oh my God, is he going to be a murderer? Like, exactly. I have, exactly. To, yes, I have to, right. te- I have to teach him right now that this behavior yeah. will never I, be acceptable. That's the, yeah, that was the, you know, with Rafi, I was like, like teaching him lessons. Mm-hmm. I'm like, I got to teach him like, you know, Again, it sounds again. It sounds very dark, but like, you know, just be like, I I must make it clear once and for all, right? Via whatever, like a timeout or like my re- you know, my my stern reaction to this mm-hmm. um, thing that he's doing. I must teach him a lesson, right? right? And that is something that with Ilya, like possibly to a fault, where like now he's really kind of. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, really doesn't listen to us even more than Rafi. Yeah. Doesn't make you, you know, some things you're like, oh, it is us actually. <laughs> We're the problem here. <laughs> but, but, um, with you know, I, I just I've kind of discarded that notion of like teaching him a lesson, right? Because like actually it doesn't work. Like they're too little. You're like you're not teaching them a lesson. You're just you're just making everybody miserable. Yeah. Um, See, I just um, felt like I had to correct the behaviors so that we could end them and then go back to the warm, fun stuff that I was all right. ready for, right? It's like, right. no, you can't hit your mother because she won't let you have a like candy bar for breakfast. And yes. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come down really hard on that, partly yeah. intentionally and partly instinctively, right? Yeah. Because yes. of my own hardwiring, my own right. fucked up head. I'm going to come down way too hard on that behavior, yeah. freak you both out. Right. Yep. And, but, but, but my hope is that like, it'll clear it away and then we'll just be this like beautiful, happy trio and then yeah. a qu- and then a quartet. And it didn't, it never happened. Just the conflicts just got bigger and bigger and bigger and louder. <laughs> and, you know, you describe that point where one time you really kind of, you know, you lose it with them and he's lost it yeah. and he starts yeah. laughing in that kind of defense yes. mechanism. Uh, yeah. That, Right. That happened to us too. And that was the scariest thing because it's primal, yeah. right? Like when yeah. you really scare your son, they laugh like a lunatic and you're like, yeah. oh no, I broke his brain. You know, this is not the expected reaction to my losing my temper, right? You yes. would expect tears yes. or, or something yeah. else, but the laughter really. Yeah. And uh, it, like, you know, so much of the stuff I was, is this, do I have a right kind of right about this? Huh. Um, you know, given I do my best, but I'm still like the number two parent, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I am not the MVP around here. And, uh, Emily is, you know, you'll like, always be Pippin. You're never going to be joy. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. And, um, she's the MVP, but like, but then there's these things, you know, and like the first essay I wrote was about teaching him Russian, you know? Mm-hmm. And I, like, that was my thing, obviously. Like I, Emily doesn't know Russian, right? I was the one who was speaking Russian to him. And then like, and then, uh, because we were having, we had to do the, go through the school's selection process, for like just finding like a pre-K um, in Brooklyn uh, right after Ilya was born. So kind of like Emily was too busy. So I got sent to all the, I was like deputized to go to all the school tours. Right. So that was this thing that I, like I was doing. And then, but then like the third thing I wrote was the thing about anger. Yeah. And, you know, we, obviously we both get angry, you know, but it's different. Right. It's like the mother's anger is this in a way it's worse for the, you know, like when Emily infrequent, much less frequently than I do, gets angry. But when she gets angry, partly because it's, it's less frequent and, but partly because it's mama, Mm -hmm. you know, that Mm -hmm. 
like Raffy finds that really uh, upsetting, right? Um, Truly but, scary. With, whereas for the most yeah. part, we're just a lot of you know noise and racket. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But you know, yeah, and yet, well, it's, I think it's truly like emotionally scary. Like, whereas like mm-hmm. there is something you know, the dad is like bigger and and like you know mostly right there's a difference know. between like an action film and a horror film right like like a father's <laughs> anger is just like tom cruise you know and a mother's yeah, anger is like yeah. holy shit like what is happening right. my whole world is yeah. is, is yes <laughs> yes spinning um, yeah but it, I, I, I but like you know i guess my thought was just like there is something there is something distinctive about the father's anger and um I don't know, like we have testosterone and like we do lose our temper more, right? And and Do you think it'd be different if we had girls? It's counterfactual. Uh, Go. Oh, yeah. I mean You imagine yelling at a daughter the way you yell at a son? I mean I don't think so. That would be so uh, yeah, I can't even I can't even There's something, you know there's something a little oedipal about the whole thing, not in the, you know, with the weird, you know, actual (laughs) the actual Freudian stuff, but like just the, the the struggle between father and son, it's father and eldest son. I mean, it's biblical, right? Like, and yeah. it starts at three, not at twenty. At three, right. it starts right yeah. where you're like, no, 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 no. Look, I'm as I'm as as modern as the next. I'm as feminist as the next guy. But God damn it, you can't take over in my own kitchen. But like, you didn't pay for this kitchen. And that's where I start talking like my dad, right? Like this sort of patriarchal, yeah. you know, authority figure. Cause, cause that's what's being attacked. And in some ways I have set up all the conditions for him to attack that with every other choice I've made as a parent and as a, and as a person, right. To be this different kind of man than of course, like my baby boomer, conservative Christian Texan father, right. We have totally different value system and personality traits. And now I have this little boy who is, you know, who's coming up in that, in that soil. And he's like, you can't fucking pull this authority figure card now. <laughs> like, we're not doing that. That's not who we yeah. are. So he'll say to me, like, he doesn't say, uh, you're not a nice dad. He tells me, you are severe. Why are you so wow. severe? You're so much more severe than mommy. Was your dad severe? Was Grandpa Dewey severe? I'm like, fuck yeah, uh-huh. he was, man. You have no idea. You don't know from severe. <laughs> I mean, that's, I, you know, yeah, the, the word that Rafi used was uh, serious. He says, mm. why are you so serious? Like, this is, I think it's in the book. He's like, he's like, why are you so serious? Why are you so, why are you so serious all the time? And again, what he meant was, why do I turn off the TV? <laughs> but like, he did, he like was making this distinction between, um, me and mama. And then, but yeah, but one of the, yeah, one of the things that I explained to him, I'm like, my dad yelled at me, yeah. you know, um, his dad got half his face shot off, uh, right. you know, by the Germans. <laughs> yeah. And <laughs> you know, the conditions, the right? Like that's, guy in the world. Yeah. I think that's part of it too, which is that like, at some point along the line, I began to have these like minor little resentments over like how good this kid has it and how he has no <laughs> idea. So when he's having a meltdown, yeah. Because I won't yeah. give him a Band-Aid for a non-existent wound. I'm like, dude. <laughs> I need a Band-Aid. And he's like, he says to me, like, I hate you. You're the worst dad ever. And I want to die. And I want everyone to die. Yeah. And he just goes yeah. full apocalyptic. <laughs> and I'm like, motherfucker, can we get some context here? You know? So, so that yeah, becomes part of it. But that's yeah. my problem, right? Because from his right. perspective, the non-existent wound you know, yes. is worthy of an apocalyptic event. Yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> the other day, I I, uh, I had them in the car just by myself for a very long time. We we're driving to Massachusetts, and uh, mm-hmm. you know, I was. It's just it was like an eight-hour drive, and I was very patient for like first five hours, and then I lost it, and I just screamed. They were like, they were like in. They had got these little flags somewhere, and they were just like whacking each other with them, and they, they wouldn't stop. And they were like scream. They would start crying, you know, crying, and then they'd start again. Anyway, so finally, I just screamed at them, and and Rafi was like, Ilya, we don't have a papa anymore. <laughs> a dada. Ilya was like, that's right. Rafi's like, right? And Ilya's like, yeah, we don't have one. And they were just, yeah, they were just like, we have no, we have no dad. We're orphans. We have no dad. Yeah. yeah. And then, but we were like still stuck in the car. So I get to like hear all this. And yeah. then they were, and then Rafi's like, I miss having a dad. 
And so they kind of talked themselves back into having this. <laughs> and, but the whole time I was like, I was like, you know, like, like it or not. And it's just to my, I was, I was done talking to them, but mm-hmm. I was just like, I'm your dad, you know, it, like, man. stuck with me. And, you know, and so like, I don't know when I, and I felt terrible about screaming at them. And yet I, you know, like it kind of, they got over it. I got over it. Right. They, they didn't hit each other with their flags anymore right. for the next three hours. Um, and I, I kind of did get to make it up to them. I mean, that's the amazing thing is like, you screw, you, you really, you screw up, you get mad, but mm-hmm. then like here, they, there they are in half an hour, <laughs> you know? And, and, you know, and sometimes you're like, you want to be like, I'm so sorry. Uh, but which isn't, you know, I kind of like, I try to avoid, you know, being like going, for, you know, begging for forgiveness. Him. Yeah. I mean, you know, I'll, like if, if, if it gets, you know, if it, if I scare him or something, I'll, I will, you know, give him a hug. Right. But sure. I, I try not to like burst into tears and be right. like a totally Freak him out unstable more. person. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> But yeah, you know, like, you know, I'm like, okay, I'm still here and, and I'm not yelling at you. There's an know? opportunity for and, grace always in a yeah, kid's day. Like, and, and it's, you know, cause, and they're going to be here for a while, yeah. you know, and I'm going to be here for a while. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's like the, uh, the factory where you're like, they're like, you know, two days without an accident, three days without an accident, <laughs> you know, and then you go back to zero. But like, it, then you, it does then feel you like shit, again. man. That's yeah. exactly the way it feels where you're like, and you get to like seven days and you're like, well, this is the new era, baby. We're good. We're good. Now. Yes. And then it happens again. Yes. You're like, fuck. Um, well, that's, I mean, that's the, the amazing thing is that like, I wrote that whole essay about, uh, Bear Dad. yelling and, and being mad, mad, no, the love and anger, right. Mm-hmm. Just about being mad. And like, and then as I was finishing it, Rafi like did go through this phase where he was much chill. Like he'd kind of approaching four and it's kind of an age of like, uh, like seeing the world and like starting to explain it in these funny ways Mm -hmm. and um, kind of stopped being quite such a jerk. And I was like, ah, you know, I did it. it. (laughs) We made it through. I did it. Yeah. I said, well, I, (laughs) I survived. He survived. We survived. And then like, you know, I write and I finished the essay you know, and then like two months late, like before it even comes out, it takes a while for these things to come out sometimes before it even comes out. He enters this new phase of, you know, thinking of stuff to do to really upset me. <laughs> and I'm back to yelling at him again. And I'm like, I'm kind of like, Rafi, we already, we already did this, right. you know, I already wrote the essay, like, let's move on. But, but I, you don't move on. And they kind of invent these new ways, right? Because they've changed, they've, they've matured. They become smarter. They become more articulate. Like they, they do find new ways of pushing the exact again. same button. Yeah. Right. Yeah, um, yeah. Whether it's the button of like, I can't believe how brilliant and, and adorable this person is, or I don't have a temper anymore. It's gone. It's out. It's, <laughs> you know, it's in another County. Cause I'm yes. so, so, yeah, yeah. it's, yeah. they're always themselves as they, as they, as they develop through these stages. Exactly. Um, yeah. I, I think I, I, I consistently fail to appreciate the way that he actually sees me because we have so much like conflict and argument yeah, and because he can step to me with such ferocity. I always think that like, you know, he must see me as this sort of deeply flawed man, (laughs) right? Which I am, (laughs) but, but of course, but he's also a six year old boy and he sees me like make a jump shot and he's like, well, you're the greatest basketball player in the world. right? Right. Right. And I, I don't register that. Right. And I don't appreciate what that means to him, you know, which is that he is now putting that pressure on himself to be perfect right now. Right. Because he actually thinks for the most part, everything I pick up, everything I do, I do perfectly. I can read books. I can even write them. I can work a computer. I can drive a car. I do all these things from his perspective without making mistakes. And as, and as talented and special of a, of a little guy he is. He's obsessed with being perfect. He's so hard on himself when he can't do something instantly. Right. Um, it's really hard to remember. Like I have to actually show him my frustrations, my failures, my struggles, and my own frustration like with myself in a healthy way and model that to him. Or I'm just compounding his own like perfectionism, you know? Yeah. And well, you know, another <laughs> you know, another argument for like being Again, within reason, but like being authentic mm-hmm. as a person, right? And this is something that Emily said to me, like 
once that I that I, that I thought was very wise, where you know these, these these parenting books they really want you to become like a bit of a robot parent, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. And you know, one you no of them longer have emotions of your own. You're only yeah, you're totally you're, dialed you're right. into their emotional experience, which can or I mean, the one I was thinking of is like there's this one where that's that's I forget which one it is, but which parenting guru is the one who says this, but like I think she says something like you need to be the calm you know, CEO of your family. Right. And like, that's appealing in certain ways, right? Like your kid needs, you know, a calm environment and like clear boundaries. Right. And then like, I think one, at one point where I was like very down on myself for, for uh, yelling at Rafi, Emily's like, you know, it's okay for, for him to see us that we're like human beings. Yeah. You know, so that's again, you know, within like, you know, you don't want to be a shitty human, <laughs> but like somebody who, yeah, who has, who fails and is, is frustrated and, and is imperfect. Yeah. That's okay. Like it's okay for them to see. That. I don't know. I, so many of the themes of the essays connect. Um, and you know, they're, they're all about very different subjects, right? Teaching him Russian, playing sports with him, your own upbringing and, and how that connects to issues of cultural identity and ancestry and all of that. But it, it always kind of, for me, circles around that sort of that that line, right? There is no tragedy like the tragedy of parenthood. Mm. This kind of beautiful yeah. contradiction or paradox, almost of of, of loving your kids right. so much, you know. Yeah. And there's this, this amazing line I read it to Chanel this morning, and uh, she agrees with me that it's just uh, unspeakably beautiful. And I'm going to read it right now. It's from the Russian essay, the Russian language essay. A few days after that, he said his first Russian sentence. I am a hippopotamus. I was deeply, stupidly, indescribably moved. What had I done? How could I not have done it? What a brilliant, stubborn, adorable child. My son. I hope he never goes to Russia. I know that eventually he will. Oh, man. It's so good, because that's the paradox right there, right? That's the paradox. The, 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 The brilliant stubbornness and the you know, the, wanting to give him this inheritance and then being like, oh, shit, what have I done? Um, yeah, and then yeah. knowing that, like, that's still his to figure out one day. And I mean, to me, that's like, you know, of all these things, it's the one that's kind of the most interesting because you're like, ah, oh, it's, every, you know, everybody's like, oh, it's so wonderful that you're teaching him Russian, you know? And I'm like, are you sure? You know, like, have, like right. you know, the end point of him learning Russian or like, or one of the stages is for him to go to Russia, yeah. <laughs> right? And, ah, you know, even when I wrote that, it was like, you know, three years ago, um, you know, you, it, Russia wasn't doing great, uh-huh. you know, and now it reads, you know, even even more so. It's like, you really don't want your kid to go to Russia right now. Um, and, and when will you? Like, when is this going to end? Yeah. Um, it'll end someday, but I don't know when. And, you know, so it's, it's like all these things you know, all these things in, in our very imperfect <laughs> society, right? Mm-hmm. Where you're like, it's almost like there's nothing you can think of that you're going to pass on to your kid that isn't, you know, connected to some form of, you know, violence or exploitation of you know, sports, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, I love sports. But like, if you look at, you know, you know, hockey is like probably the nastiest kind of locker room environments i've ever been in mm. were, were around hockey like the whitest mm-hmm. you know like the most homophobic mm-hmm. right more so, you know i played football and soccer like football wasn't like that you know right. um you know yeah so like it's like it's like everything that you're trying to teach your kid we li- we exist in this like very nasty world and it's it's hard to think of anything you're going to pass on um that isn't tainted by that stuff yeah makes it uh harder (laughs) yes it does but more poignant when you can express it that way Keith. and you know i I guess that's where i would i would wrap things up you know um you write this amazing epilogue about rafi at six six and a half you know as as the book is as you finished you've essentially finished all the essays and and you're kind of telling us like this is what he's like now and uh, i read that line to you earlier he's adorable infuriating mercurial he still treats us like servants he is unlike anyone we have ever met so in, in the spirit of that epilogue, I made a list of all the notable things that my six and a half year old has done just in the last 24 hours. <laughs> uh, he wrote me a beautiful song on his ukulele called 
wow. smile on your face. He played a pretty competitive game of chess with me. He ranked our whole family in order of physical beauty with him first and me last, um, which isn't necessarily <laughs> wrong. It's an interpretation, but uh, he conquered a new ramp at the skate park and had an epic meltdown leaving the skate park because I didn't capture that feat on video. I mean, this was like throwing shit down the stairs kind of meltdown big time. Um, he counted all of his money twice um, and he congratulated me on getting much better with my patience lately, oh, yeah. um, which is both nice. like really touching and also like, have yeah. you been paying it? Like, what is your sense yeah. of time here? What do you mean by <laughs> lately? You mean in the last hour? In the, in the um, last hour, you've been very. But he was like a long time. speech, you know, like he really presented wow. like an award to me of like, you've gotten <laughs> so much better on your patience, uh, even though I'm still so much harsher than mommy. Um, yeah. So, yeah. you know, and it just leaves me and it kind of takes me back to, you know, that that tension, that kind of irresolvable tension that we're talking about. And then it's at the heart of your book and, and, and at the heart of these sort of philosophical dilemmas about parenting. But as I've been thinking about these things, I've also been able to do it while kind of living with your book. You know, we were on a two week road trip. We just got back from two weeks, 15 states, wow. eight cities, Whoa. one Prius four people, right? Like we, we did it. We really spent that time together and I took your book with me and I read it and, and just having it with me and reading your experience and the way that you've kind of worked your way through these tensions makes it more manageable to me because it's like, I have the right company. And again, it's not that I'm like getting the answers to how to do this, but just knowing it's sort of a gift to, to have your book and to commune with it and know that you're down there in Brooklyn, you know, with the same, going through the same thing. I'm, I feel fortified and comforted by that. And that's, you know, that's, that's the whole idea of this podcast too, right? That we can sort of tell these stories and describe the problems, even if we can't necessarily prescribe a, a, a universal solution to them. Um, I, you know, I thank you so much. Like that's, you know, it's, uh, somebody asked me, they're like, um, did you, you know, from writing this book, did you become a better parent? And the answer is no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, and also like it has caused problems, you know, in our home, Like, you know, it's just, it's just tough. You know, everybody's very supportive, but like, it's tough to become a character in someone else's book. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And so. Emily, it's been, it's been tough. Um, Rafi has very mixed feelings about it. Half the time he wants, he's very happy that he's famous or he wants to be famous. Uh -huh. uh, sure. And then he, you know, then he looks at, and then he kind of reads something in the book and he says, this is not true <laughs> or, or, you know, it's not true anymore. We're going to open the libel write, laws up, Pop. We're going to take yeah, care of this right here. <laughs> well, there was like, in the epilogue, I say that he climbs, uh, he, he stacks a chair on top of another chair to get to the high shelf to get some candy in the mornings. Yep. And he read that and he's like, ah, I don't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, you, you, as of two weeks ago, you were doing it. You're not, I agree with you. You stopped doing that, but you used to do that very recently. But for him, he's like, this yeah. is just false. It's a fake. Yeah. Um, but he, yeah, he actually said he was going to write a, uh, a book. A rebuttal. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's called Raising Raffi is Fake <laughs> by Raffi. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so, so, but oh hearing you say, and like, that. and you know, and, and so, yeah, as, as I was saying earlier, like I wrote, you know, love and anger about being angry and it didn't change our relationship at all. Like I still get angry, you know, it didn't do anything for me. So um, it's only caused problems. <laughs> uh, so hearing you say that you have found it, um, I don't know, helpful or comforting is, uh, um, is very meaningful to me. So thank you. Thank you, Keith.
Really fast. Really fast. Like my brother. Like your brother, yeah. My brother can go really fast on his bike. So can you. You can go really fast on your bike. No, my brother can go this fast. Oh. That's how my brother can go. And I can go this fast. Yeah, but you're going faster and faster. Every time you go on your bike, you go faster and faster. There are more ways to fuck this up than there are units of patience, empathy, and self-control in my spiritual well some days. So one thing we can do here on Padre is first acknowledge that. Acknowledge the difficulty and challenges of being a parent, of being a dad, that everyone goes through. But we can go further than that. So right now it's my honor to present the very first, the very prestigious, Not a Terrible Father in This One Instance Award. Look, I feel a certain way about awards in general, okay? But the Not a Terrible Father in This One Instance Award, this prize, speaks entirely to an individual's merit, to their performance and excellence on the field of dadhood. At least, according to me, and me alone. This is as pure as a prize gets, and the first ever, the first ever, Not a terrible father in this one instance award goes to Dr. Ricardo Nuila, MD of Houston, Texas, father of Valentina and Teo. We're going to give Ricardo a call here in a minute and present him with the award, but let me just tell you a few things about him first. Ricardo is a doctor and a writer. He saves people's lives at the hospital. He teaches medicine and medical ethics at Baylor College of Medicine, and somehow he finds time to write some of the best nonfiction being published today. You can find his work in The New Yorker, The Atlantic, The New York Times, Texas Monthly. His new book, The People's Hospital, Hope and Peril in American Medicine, will be published by Simon & Schuster this spring. It's going to be at the center of the conversation around public policy and the human realities of our healthcare system for a long time. But you know, as impressive as all that is, I don't know if any of it's going to compare to being the very first recipient of the Not a Terrible Father in This One Instance Award. So let's call him up. Hello? Ricardo. Dude, what's up, man? Hey, buddy. How you doing? Okay. How are you? you? you You are on the line right now. You are on the air live on Padre. Live? Shit. Welcome to Padre. I'm, I'm honored to be on this. It's Thank good, you. I'm it's good to have glad you. that it's up and running and that I am your selected guest. Well, you're actually more than that. And I'll explain in a minute what I mean by that. But I wondered if you could tell our listeners, you and I were talking the other day and you told me a story um, that involved travel. The passport story. Yeah, I can. Every summer we go to Mexico. I grew up going to El Salvador uh, during the summers. My wife went to Mexico during her summers. And so we want the same for the kids. And I think a couple of weeks before our flight, uh, it becomes obvious that my wife has lost her passport. Now I, you know, just an aside, I had seen it lying around the house Mm -hmm. and I told her, you need to put this away. Mm -hmm. And it, she didn't and she lost it. And of course this engendered a lot of debate because she thought that maybe I had been the person that might have uh, misplaced the passport. And the kids, uh, as the date approached, the kids were totally unaware. They were still extremely excited about going to Mexico. They're visiting their grandparents. They're going to a school down there. Uh, they just love going to Mexico. They're going to go to school in the summertime. And how old are Valentina and Teo now? Valentina six and Teo turned four. And they just love being around their grandparents and and everything about Mexico, because there's just a lot, you know, we get to play around with them a lot. So like, they have their hearts set on this trip. They're getting excited as it gets. Oh, as yeah. It's yeah they're, 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 they they pack their bags like I mean, they don't pack their bags, but, you know, they they you know they put all their shit in, in like a, in, in like a little backpack two uh-huh. weeks before and everything. And they have no well, idea that you lost Val's passport. No. no. And the only appointment they could give her was for the day of travel. She says, okay, my appointment is at 7 o'clock in the morning. I'll get my passport, and we can hit our 10.30 a.m. flight. And I was just like, yeah, I don't think that's going to happen. So I wasn't scheduled to go on the flight. The flight is just Val, my wife, and the two kids. Uh, Mm -hmm. I have work that week. 
And so I was going to join them later. And also, you know, and they work. like to have some time with, with their family down there a little bit. So you I was say like, work, right. what's you say work. I mean, it reminds me what kind of line of work you're in. You do something kind of fairly important. What is it you do? You're a, um, uh, I, uh, influencer I, of some kind. What is it? <laughs> I work at a safety net hospital. I'm a hospitalist at a safety net hospital. And, um, and oh, you're a doctor. I, That's right. You're a doctor. A doctor. Yes, doctor. Okay. Doctor. Internal, medicine doctor. Internal medicine. Internal medicine. Remember yeah. that time I, I, I referred to you as a, as a, uh, what was it? As a, as an ER doctor. And you yeah, flipped I out. That from my, I wiped <laughs> that from my memory. Thanks for re traumatizing. <laughs> no. And so I was like, all right, y'all go to, you know, that was the plan. They're going to go to Mexico a week early. I was going to join them later and, mm-hmm. and it was okay. Except that, you know, the, the day comes for her passport. You know, she calls me within an hour. She's like, there's no freaking way I'm getting my passport by our 1030 AM flight. So I'm in the car with the kids and I'm like, oh, I think that you all might not go to Mexico today. This was mm-hmm. like around 8 AM in the morning. We're supposed uh-huh. to be headed to the airport. And they take that in stride, of course. Oh, yeah, yeah. They're very mature about it. No, they, <laughs> they, it's one of those things where it's like the bad news makes them fight with themselves. You know, they start clawing. Like, it's almost like Valentina heard it, and when and, and she got upset, and Teo heard it, and she got – and so Valentina got mad at Teo for being upset, but they were both <laughs> – they were all like – it was like we were driving in the middle. Of and like, then you're yelling at him for you hitting each other, and then it's just pure, pure chaos. Oh, I, it's, just, it's just like, what the hell? So – an idea dawns on me right there because they're freaking out in the car. I'm like, I'm going to take you all to Mexico. I say it to them like that. I was like, I'm going to take you all to Mexico. <laughs> buckle, is, buckle up. We're going to Mexico. Now, I didn't, you know, I might have overpromised at that moment, but I was just like, I didn't know, I didn't know <laughs> what the flight was going to cost, but I was just like, and I do have limits. So I was like, but I think I can do it. So I looked it up and it was actually pretty reasonable. It's a, it's one of those budget Mexican airlines. So, so I, so you're I teetering like, I, on the edge here, you know, just know. This, this is such a perilous path that you're walking here. You're you I know, know. over promising. Exactly. exactly. I was, I, it, it really was because I was, I, I could have easily been like, Oh, it's actually 600 bucks a flight. Uh, daddy's not taking it. <laughs> Never mind. I don't know what the hell I was thinking saying that. No, <laughs> I, I looked it up and I was like, okay, it's doable. And I told, Val, my wife, I was just like, we save their tickets. I take them. And more than anything, they're not upset. But I was like, all right. I got went home, threw a bunch of stuff in the bag, purchased the ticket, and we sped off to the to the airport. Now, my wife, like, she fears flying with the kids because of, like, what, the, you know, the fight. Because I mean, she's done it before. Because she's yeah. sane. Because she, yes, you yes, know, yes, learns exactly. from experience. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. It's, it's a rational no, it's fear. True. It's, it's a rational true. fear. Yeah. It is a rational fear. And so, you know, I think she was also taken aback that I was just, like, going to jump into it. But I was like, all right, we're going. You know what my theory, but, you know, sidebar, um, yeah. I don't understand why they don't have kids sections on airplanes imagine if the back of the plane was just for all the kids and all the babies and you throw some toys and treats back there and, and there's and one should. there's one flight attendant who goes back there and does like a puppet show and all yeah. the parents are up in the front part of the plane in the parent section of the plane and they Can should bring imagine? back the smoking section back there and too, and just like we're it smoking and we're drinking yeah. and we're laughing and we're relaxed we go to the airport and you know, I get my, I have my ticket. We get and uh, and we say goodbye to my wife, and I, and I, it's, it's me and the kids. Did Things you did you really apologize nice. to her for losing her passport and denying it and <laughs> trying to make her feel like it was all her fault? Dude, I was actually excited about it because I actually kind of like the idea of flying with the kids because I feel like. You're playing, well, I, you're playing yeah. hooky from work and it's a sudden, it's a sudden change. And you got the yeah. adrenaline of, we got to get to the airport. And right when we get to the gate, it's like uh, delayed for an hour and then it's in two hours. And that's when all of my wife's fears start coming to like <laughs> air, you know, like the kids are starting to get antsy. They're like, what the hell? Why aren't we going to Mexico and everything, <laughs> you know? And like, they start are, are we in Mexico yet? Is this Mexico? Are we yeah. there yet? Have we already taken the plane? They start asking yeah. those wonderful I questions. I mean, it's, it's, it's like, you know, Teo's favorite thing to say is like, it's taking forever, you know, it's like, <laughs> and everything is taking forever. Uh, so, so sensing that I, 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 I tell him, 
like I commit a venial sin, a little white lie, tell uh-huh. them that there's baby cops throughout the host- throughout the airport. In fact, there's one of them right there. That's like this passerby. This dude. This is, a, a, this is a cop who is also a baby. Is yeah. that? <laughs> no, no, no. This is a guy who's looking for babies who are crying. I wow, tell him. that's dark, bro. That's dark. He's, and and that there's a baby jail that he takes. I mean, listen, <laughs> listen, dude. There's a whole I, baby carceral state. It, yes, there's it, a whole it's, it's Big Bush Brother International big, Airport. Big baby brother, big baby brother. You know, it's like anybody who's passing by, I'm like, that guy might be a baby cop. Play it <laughs> like play it. Act, act like you're not a baby crying because he takes crying babies to jail. And it works. It works. And like Valentina's at that age. Of course she, it works. He's absolutely petrified with fear and panic. No, no, you don't know my kids. <laughs> You scare them like that all the time. He's used to it. Dude, my kids are Latin America. They don't get it. They do not get they do not get scared of stuff like that. No, but it, it's it's um Valentina's at that age where she recognizes that daddy's probably full of shit, but I like mm. playing this game with so she's uh, in a she's a, she's an accomplice now. Yeah, yeah, she's kind of she's actually kind of like trying to figure it out the whole time. Is this like is she's this like, real? No, What's but daddy's she, angle I, here. I, I'm yeah. pretty I'm pretty sure that she's like, nah, this is there's no baby jail because she starts <laughs> telling him she's like, that's right, tail like the baby jail, you know. So, um, but but it yeah. it works. It's like you know, <laughs> there's just like random people going by, and I'm like, I th- miming them. It's just like, have you seen any baby crying? And I was like, there's this one. Boy. There's one blonde haired going over there, you know, like maybe, maybe he was crying before and, uh, the plane ride is fine. I get to even freaking read on a plane. I don't think I've, I had read on a plane, mm. um, in with the kids no. ever, ever, right. Mm-hmm. Get to read. I was reading Cormac. Oh, Cormac. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You're reading blood Meridian while your children no, dark, behave outer themselves. Dark. Outer dark. Yeah. That's a, that's a very dark one. That's a that's dark. super dark, man, that's and it's about a and it's about a baby that's left out in the woods to die. You know, you know what? This so, just gets better and better, Ricardo. This just this yeah, they're past, the, they're past the age. They're past the age where like they're crying because their ears won't pop. You know, they're able to just like yeah. sit there with the tablet yeah. and like amuse yeah. themselves. Yeah. Uh-huh. It does feel like an achievement actually to get to that age where they're like, okay, they can put their attention on something and like. I had downloaded Sing 2 for them, and they were watching it there. So it was pretty awesome. Um, well, good. That's, and that also sounds, you know, age appropriate. You weren't, like, letting them listen to the audio book of Cormac McCarthy's Outer Dark or anything. <laughs> That's good. That's good. All right. So you That's make right. it to Mexico in one piece. Everybody's happy. Everyone's glad. Everybody's happy. And then we, 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 we happen to arrive at the same time as four other flights. And there's one attendant for the immigration line. So we have to wait in line for an hour. We get through that with the baby cop story. I mean, they're, now it's a Mexican baby cop. So it, <laughs> it, and, and, and it's like, it's, 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 you brought it to the table. It's like, hey, dad, I need some cash. And, <laughs> the, and the airport has like little rooms that look like they could be baby jails. Uh, you know I mean? That actually <laughs> might be baby jails for yeah, all you know. Exactly. I mean, <laughs> so, so Teo's listening more. We're getting through the line. I even have somebody tell me. Your kids are so well behaved, wow. and I'm just like, that I mean, that good. is just like, I'm, dude, good. dude, can you imagine that? Can you imagine? I, this was unimaginable for me before this day. And did you get a lot? Did you get any people saying weird shit to you, like, like, where's mommy, or like, are these, sir, are these really your children? You know, or like, that's any- a really good question. Actually, no, I don't, I don't remember it, but I do remember. No, I don't. I don't think I did get something like that. But I, I seem to remember somebody saying something at one time. I don't think it was like that pointed, but something. Well, I'm glad you didn't, because you don't. You don't deserve that. You know, yeah, they're your kids. All. Just you know, they're my fucking kids. That's why I, I'm here. I, but you know, I'm actually. They probably saw me, and they were like, "This dude can't be doing anything wrong," because he seems kind of elated right now. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, is he high? Traffic, Look at him. Look at him. If he's trafficking kids, like you would think that a trafficker. <laughs> would have like a scowl on it but this he's this insouciant like, it's it feel it felt like i was throwing a no hitter dude it mm-hmm. felt like you know mm-hmm. it felt like we're, we're we're getting through the bottom of the seventh you know and and it's just like okay ricky's no no know? yep mm-hmm. i mean everything is is yeah sure you can one can argue that the baby jail could discard my uh son for life but at the same time one could one could but we but could, i won't but, i'm uh, not gonna argue that i think it's fine <laughs> We, so we get through customs. We get on a shuttle. That's another hour and a half. The kids are just – listen to this. The kids are looking outside of the sh- – like through the countryside of Mexico, and they are just simply like thinking and looking at the countryside for an oh. hour and a half. Oh. 
They are not doing oh. anything else. Oh. Can you imagine that? They didn't They're ask not, for a snack? They didn't ask for a single damn thing. They just looked outside at the countryside and thought. Wow. And I'm serious about that. They contemplated? They contemplated. Oh my they were God. like travelers for like an hour and a half. They had side. like an inner life going on and they were. Yeah. Wow. Not, and, and, and I mean, if you know my kids, that is like a huge shock, man. Uh-huh. But we, we get into my in-laws house and I, I tell them they were angels. And that, that's, uh, yeah, that's, that's the story, man. Because of you, because you, because you did it. You were, you were the strong and steady guide. I'd like to think so. I have to say, you know? I'd like to. I'd, I'd like to think that that was nice. It, you put it was on a, your it was cool. It you was put awesome. on your cape and you fucking flew into action and and you took them to Mexico. You did it. I just did it, and it was it was everything worked out okay. Work was okay. And Val, Val made it there okay. How long she did it take it her? Two days. Two days later, completely like relaxed and refreshed. She needed that time to unplug from the kids, and it was it was fine. Now the kids were still like rough the next day, dude. Don't I mean like it was just like. But you know, were- this, to me, the story is about like, and this isn't just a dad thing. This is a parent thing, right? That like you have a plan, right? Mm-hmm. Something like a family vacation. It's a huge ordeal. Everyone's got to kind of get their time off work, and you got to make all the arrangements, and you got to spend all the money, and it's a stressful thing, right? It's not a vacation. It's a trip. Mm-hmm. Right. It's not a vacation. You're not going there to relax when you have young kids. You're going there to have an experience as a family. Right. And it's stressful. And in the last minute, right, everything goes haywire. And it requires, you know, calling this like huge audible, calling up your work and shifting things around and move this around. But you know, a lot of people in that situation, I think, would just shut down or say, like, this is no longer un- under my control and I'm you know, yeah, and that there's no way to salvage this. But you didn't do that, man. You got creative. Well, you know, I have, it made me think that maybe like we should all be more spontaneous because maybe the reason why it's so stress because l- trust me, all of our trips are stressful, like the way you said it. This was different, and I think in part it's because it's like there was no time to put all that stress to put those expectations on. But we you knew just- that it was important to your children. To, yeah. to go to Mexico and be with their family and have this experience in another country. And you made that be, you know, more important than whatever pressure and stress and disappointment um, you may have felt on the day of when, all, when the plan went to shit. And they rewarded you by actually soaking up the experience yeah. and, yeah. and, uh, and exactly making the most right. of it. So, they did, I feel like they did reward me. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> so that's the thing, man. Like you, you – put yourself out there and you give something and you get it back. So here's the thing, Ricardo, I'm asking you to tell this story, not just because it's a good story, but because this experience of yours, we want to recognize and acknowledge to our community of listeners. And we have a particular way of doing that here on Padre. Mm -hmm. You, Ricardo Nuila, are the first recipient of the prestigious not a terrible father in this one instance award. <laughs> so congratulations, my friend. Does it come with some sort of uh, cash prize? Like, I mean, at least a little gift card, like to Target or something like that. Or wow, 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 wow. Does it come with money? Uh, yeah, right. that's second season, huh? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's it, it's it, it's this is an award. This is about maybe I should have won this second. Maybe I should have told you this next year. So I tell I you what. I tell you, I'm going to let you choose because you know clearly this kind of thing is very important to you. I'm going to let you choose. Do you want a Padre hoodie? Do you want a Padre oh. a very form fitting fashion forward T shirt? Do you want? A coffee mug. I know that you're a big coffee drinker. You name your particular item of Padre merch, and that is what you shall have. But that's not really. Does it just say Padre? Does it have like your image on it? Because that really. It's it's actually just my face. Like my face is synonymous with the show. That being like a really good ironic T-shirt. Because here's the thing, man. (laughs) Like you're gonna. This is this this award. You walk down the street, people are gonna recognize you. They're gonna say, "Hey, Ricardo." You're the not a terrible father in this one instance award. Hey, winner. You know, I love that. I love that. Winner of the inaugural not such a bad father in this one particular instance award. I can not see that. a terrible father in this one instance award, man. It's you. Congratulations, so. buddy. Uh, you deserve it. You're making us proud here at Padre. I hope I see you soon. We're going to have you back on the show when the book comes out. We're really awesome. excited about it. 
Um, awesome. Th- thanks for being Thank here. You, man. All right, dude. Take right, care. A rich man's world. All right. That's our show. Join us next time when I'll be talking to the decorated poet, best selling memoirist, legendary storyteller, Mary Carr. You don't want to miss that. So look, go subscribe to the pod. Go leave us five big fat stars on Apple Podcasts. Tell your friends to download and subscribe. Spread the word. Carry the message. Alert the villagers. Thanks again to my guests, Keith Gesson, Ricardo Nuila, and my very powerful co-hosts, Julian and Nico. Padre is created and produced by me, Chris Brunt. Additional production on this episode by John Greenhall. Original artwork for the show is by David Wojo. Special thanks again to Brad Franco. I have turned the soul of this beautiful land, but the key.